did you know that mystery and suspense fiction began in Europe? Not literally, because Edgar Allan Poe was living in the United States when he wrote the three mystery tales that inaugurated the genre, but certainly metaphorically, in the sense that each one of those tales, The Murders in the Rue Morgue, The Mystery of Marie Roget, and The Purloined Letter, was set in France. Why did Poe choose a French setting and a French detective to launch a new genre? The jury is still out on that question. It may have had something to do with the fact that Poe felt Paris possessed an air of romance and mystery that American cities of the 1840s lacked. Or it may have been simply a result of a calculation on Poe's part that a foreign setting might make the stories more appealing to readers. Whatever the reason, it turned out to be a very appropriate choice, because France in particular, and Europe in general, have a long history of taking mystery and suspense fiction more seriously than many Anglo-American readers and critics. Albert Camus, for example, once said that he used James M. Keynes, The Postman Always Rings Twice, as a model when he was writing his classic existentialist novel, The Stranger. Similarly, famous French novelist and winner of the Nobel Prize, André Gide, was a big fan of Dashiell Hammett's work, saying of Red Harvest that it was a remarkable achievement, the last word in atrocity, cynicism, and horror. Thanks to praise from literary giants like Camus and Gide, who clearly regarded mystery and suspense fiction as a legitimate and serious form of literature, American hard-boiled mystery fiction in particular was enormously popular and influential throughout Europe, and consequently the genre has a long and complicated history in this region. Although it's impossible to do justice to this history in the space of a single lecture, what I can do is give you a sense of the richness and variety of European mystery fiction. In the process, we'll see exactly what European writers did to the legacy of mystery and suspense fiction that they inherited from their Anglo-American cousins. As I've already indicated, the logical place to begin our journey is France. Although examples of mystery and suspense fiction had been published in France prior to 1931, that year changed everything, because that's when Georges Simenon began publishing the first of what would eventually be 75 novels and 28 stories featuring Inspector McGray. Technically speaking, the McGray novels are police procedurals. McGray is a police inspector, most of the novels follow the details of McGray's investigations quite closely, and the novels also include McGray's work colleagues as series characters. Nevertheless, I think it's more accurate to describe Simonon's invention as owing a significant debt to writers like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Agatha Christie. Like Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot before him, the figure of McGray dominates the narratives in which he appears, which makes him closer to the archetype of the great amateur detective, rather than a relatively anonymous member of a law enforcement organization. McGray deservedly occupies a place near the top of the genre's pantheon of famous detectives. After the first appearance of McGray in 1931, the next landmark year in French mystery and suspense fiction comes in 1945, when Marcel Duhamel, an editor at the prestigious French publishing house of Gallimard, founded the imprint Cyrie Noir. This new imprint was dedicated to publishing translations of American hard-boiled writers like Kane, Hammett, and Chandler, and the work of these writers consequently became very popular and influential in France. An early sign of this influence is an extraordinary novel published in 1946 by Boris Vian, writing under the pseudonym of Vernon Sullivan, called I Spit on Your Graves. 
Although not published by Siri Noir, Vianne's novel is exactly the kind of work that Duhamel wanted to encourage. Boris Vianne was born in Paris in 1920 and died at the age of 39 while heckling the premiere of a film version of I Spit on Your Graves. Vianne wrote the novel in two weeks after accepting a bet that he could write a bestseller in that amount of time. Vianne won the bet. The book was a huge success and also hugely controversial. Why? Vianne used the pseudonym Vernon Sullivan, but also wrote an introduction to the novel under his own name, in which he explained that Sullivan was an African-American writer whose work was too controversial to be published in the United States. Graves tells the story of Lee Anderson, a light-skinned black man who leaves town after his brother is lynched. Able to pass as white, Anderson seeks revenge for his brother's murder by seducing and then murdering two rich white sisters. The novel ends with Anderson being shot dead by the police and then being hanged by the local townspeople for good measure. The success of Graves demonstrates not only the market for sensational hard-boiled American crime fiction in post-World War II France, but also the fact that the French would believe practically anything about the United States. African-American expatriate writer Chester Himes would take advantage of this fact when he began writing and publishing his absurdly over-the-top crime novels in France in the 1950s. But in the meantime, there was also plenty of inventive and challenging mystery and suspense fiction being written by French writers using French settings. A good example is the long and prolific career of Boileau Nassajac, the collective nom de plume of Pierre Boileau and Pierre Ayrault, aka Thomas Nassajac. Before ever working together, both these men had individually won the Prix de Romain d'Aventure, awarded each year for the best work of detective fiction. Coincidentally, both their winning novels were locked room mysteries. When they started working together, they became even more successful. Beginning in 1952, with the publication of Celle qui n'était plus, published in translation as The Woman Who Was No More, as Wallow, Nasser Jack, they published many successful thrillers, many of which revolve around elaborate murder conspiracies and explored interpersonal relationships and questions of identity. They also published a series of detective novels for young readers, known as the Son Atou series, about a young boy detective, and five authorized sequels to Maurice LeBlanc's series about the gentleman thief Arsène Lupin. Their best-known work, however, is probably their two novels, which were adapted into very famous films. She Who Was No More, which was adapted by the great film director Henri-Georges Clouseau and released under the title Les Diaboliques in 1955, and their 1954 novel D'Entre les Morts, which became the basis for Alfred Hitchcock's 1959 film Vertigo. There is so much great French mystery and suspense fiction that I would like to tell you about, including the work of Jean-Claude Izzo, Jean-Patrick Manchette, Fred Vargas, and Véronique Desnen. But before we move on, let me tell you a little bit about a novel that I guarantee is like nothing you've ever read before. Georges Perec's La Disparition. Perec was a member of a French group named Ulipo, which was made up of writers and mathematicians who practiced what are known as constrained writing techniques. In particular, members of Ulipo were fond of lipograms, which are pieces of writing in which a particular letter or a group of letters are avoided. Most lipograms are usually just a few sentences or paragraphs long. But in La Disparition, Perec wrote a 300-page mystery novel without using the most common letter in the French language, the vowel E. The book's title literally means the disappearance. 
but it was translated by Gilbert Adair into English as a void. After all, the title mustn't contain an E. The plot involves a group of friends looking for a missing companion by the name of Anton Vowell, spelled V-O-W-L. As the last name Vowell implies, the novel is filled with jokes and puns and is a parody of noir fiction. But there's much more than playfulness and humor at stake here. Both Perak's parents disappear during World War II his father in combat, and his mother in the Holocaust. La Disparition has been interpreted as an expression of Perak's sense of loss and incompleteness, and his attempt to come to terms with those feelings. With that combination of playful experimentation and tragic events in mind, we're now going to jump over to Switzerland and discuss briefly the work of Friedrich Dürrenmatt. Born in 1921, Dürrenmatt was known primarily as a playwright, whose work often reflected upon World War II. But he was also the author of philosophical crime novels, including The Judge and His Hangman and Suspicion, both of which deal with such subjects as Swiss complicity with the Nazis. These novels feature Inspector Barlack, a Swiss police officer who was sent to work in Germany in the early 1930s, but who returned to Switzerland after a dispute with a Hitler official. Dürrenmatt uses Barlack to explore the moral consequences of Switzerland's neutrality during the Second World War, a policy that Dürrenmatt regarded as a lie. But it's in his 1958 novel, The Pledge, that Dürrenmatt makes possibly his greatest contribution to mystery fiction. Tellingly subtitled Requiem for the Detective Novel, the pledge systematically undoes the moral certainties of mystery fiction by showing how Matthias, a retired homicide detective, uses a young girl as bait in an attempt to capture a killer who has eluded him for years. In Durand-Matt's hands, mystery fiction becomes almost the antithesis of justice and resolution, rather than its apotheosis. The way in which both Perec and Durand-Matt use mystery and suspense fiction gives us a convenient way to now move to Germany and see how their writers address the experience of World War II. Mystery and suspense fiction in Germany has a venerable history. The well-known E.T.A. Hoffmann novella, Mademoiselle von Scuderie, published in 1819, is a crime story in which Scuderie plays a detective role, an innocent person is exonerated, and a villain is captured. A number of critics have argued that Hoffman's story was an important influence on Edgar Allan Poe when he came to write his mystery tales in the 1840s. Probably better known to English-speaking readers, however, is the work of Eric Kastner, who launched one of the most popular children's mystery series in 1929 with Emile and the Detectives. Kastner followed this very successful book with Emile and the Three Twins in 1934. Unfortunately, this book was not nearly so popular because of the Nazis, who banned the publication of Kastner's work in Germany. They exempted Emile and the detectives from this ban, though, because it was seen as too popular and too harmless to go to the trouble of banning it. It's fair to say that it took German mystery and suspense fiction writers a considerable period of time to figure out how to address the experience and the legacy of World War II in their work. This shouldn't be surprising, because in fact, relatively few examples of mystery and suspense fiction are set during a time of war. Even fewer take the opportunity to examine how in any crime novel set during wartime, the focus on a single murder and its investigation may be altered by the fact that thousands, if not millions, of war-related murders are taking place around the one murder ostensibly at the center of the narrative. 
Such examples of the genre do exist, of course. I'm thinking of the work of such writers as Martine Limon, Philip Kerr, J. Robert James, and James R. Benn, but they are few and far between. It seems that most mystery and suspense fiction writers prefer to avoid war altogether because they fear it might render an individual murder meaningless in a way that destroys both the spoken and unspoken rules of the genre. According to the critic Katerina Hall, German reunification in 1990 prompted a wide-ranging public discussion about the country's uneasy double past of fascism and communism. Thanks to this discussion, Germany is currently in the middle of a boom in historical mystery fiction. In Hall's words, the capacity of the state to persecute dissenting citizens, Nazi Germany, East Germany, the actions of individuals or groups against the state, Nazi resistors, left-wing terrorists, right-wing neo-Nazis, and the government's sometimes overzealous response, an increase in security measures, laws, and trials, all provide rich material for the historical crime author's pen. Let's look at a few examples of this work. Beginning in 2007, and now consisting of dozens of novels, the series with the collective title, It Happened in Berlin, uses the investigations of a German police inspector and later his nephew, to chart the complex history of Germany over the course of the 20th century. The project was dreamed up by well-known German crime writer and sociologist Horst Bozetsky, and has been dubbed a Ketten Roman, or chain novel, because the series is actually written by a collective of authors, with Bozetsky doing the editing. Once completed, it Happened in Berlin will constitute an exhaustive chronicle of Germany's recent history, with Berlin at its center. Less ambitious, but equally compelling, is Ferdinand von Schirach's 2011 novel, The Collini Case, which uses the apparently motiveless murder of an elderly businessman to explore West Germany's failure to prosecute former Nazi war criminals more aggressively. It's worth noting that this story also has a personal dimension for von Schirach. His grandfather was Balder von Schirach, leader of the Hitler Youth Organization. In the Kalini case, therefore, we see the author attempting to come to terms with both his family's and the nation's past. Even German writers primarily known for writing literary fiction have found the mystery and suspense fiction genre a useful way of exploring a range of issues. Bernhard Schlink, for example, is probably best known for his literary novel, The Reader. But he also has written a trilogy of novels featuring a detective named Self, which consists of Self's Punishment, which addresses the legacy of the Nazi past, Self's Deception, which focuses on terrorist acts committed in 1970s Germany by groups like the Bader Meinhof Group, and Self's Murder, which revolves around the collapse of East Germany. Finally, some German writers have used mystery and suspense fiction to address much more recent issues. The work of Jakob Arjuni, for example, features the Turkish German private investigator. Kamal Kayankaya. In novels such as Kismet and Brother Kamal, Arjuni discusses issues whose implications are still highly relevant for 21st century Germany, including the impact of the fall of communism and the Balkan Wars, as well as immigration and religious intolerance. Italian mystery and suspense fiction has also addressed issues of great importance to Italian society and culture. Not surprisingly, the impact of organized crime and the Mafia are at the top of that list. Although there were a few mystery writers working in Italy in the 19th century, the genre didn't really take off until 1929, 
when the publishing house Mondadori began to publish translations of American and British mysteries in the same way Siri Noir did in France after World War II. Mondadori's books were distinguished by their yellow covers, and for this reason they became known as I Libri Gialli, or the yellow books. Eventually, giallo became a shorthand term for the crime fiction genre as a whole, a term that eventually expanded to include films, especially horror and suspense films. Thanks to the popularity of Mondadori's Gialli translations, some Italian writers started producing their own works of mystery and suspense fiction. Unfortunately, before the genre could really get off the ground in Italy, it was first curtailed and then banned outright in 1943 by Benito Mussolini's fascist government, who felt that it was unpatriotic in the way it portrayed the state. After World War II ended, the popularity of the genre grew rapidly. A particularly significant author during this period was Carlo Emilio Gadda, whose 1957 novel, That Awful Mess on Via Merulana, was set in fascist Italy of the 1920s and provided a searing commentary on that period of Italian history. Gatta's work influenced many later Italian crime fiction authors for the way it constituted what came to be known as an anti-detective novel, which referred to a type of crime fiction where the solution is either highly ambiguous or altogether absent. A significant later example of this thread of Italian anti-mystery fiction known to many English-speaking readers is Umberto Eco's famous 1980 novel, The Name of the Rose. As befits a crime novel from Echo, who is a widely known postmodern literary theorist, this novel combines semiotics, philosophy, medieval studies, and biblical analysis with a good old-fashioned murder mystery set in a 14th century Italian monastery. The novel's protagonist, a Franciscan friar named William of Baskerville, travels to a monastery in northern Italy with his assistant, Adso of Melk, to attend a theological disputation. Once there, William learns that a suspicious death has recently taken place, one that is followed by other deaths at the monastery. The abbot asks William to investigate the killings, which all seem to revolve around the existence of a fabled book thought to have been lost, the Greek philosopher Aristotle's writings on comedy. At the novel's climax, William tries but fails to find this book in the monastery's labyrinthine library. As this brief summary suggests, the Name of the Rose is a highly self-reflexive novel, not only in the sense that it's a book about books, but also in the sense that it's a mystery novel filled with allusions to other mystery novels. To give just two examples, William of Baskerville's name is an obvious tribute to Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes novel, The Hound of the Baskervilles while the library labyrinth is a more elliptical nod to the work of the great Argentinian author of experimental mystery fiction, Jorge Luis Borges. Less well known than Echo, but probably more important to Italian crime fiction, is the work of Leonardo Sciascia, who was born in Sicily in 1921. Much of his crime fiction, beginning with The Day of the Owl in 1961, discusses the influence of the Mafia in the daily life of both Sicily in particular and Italy in general, and how it's able to sustain its power thanks in part to the corruption of the Italian political establishment. Shasha later acquired first-hand knowledge of that system because he served as a politician during the 1970s and was involved in the investigation into the government's handling of the kidnapping of the Italian politician Aldo Moro in 1978 by the Red Brigades. 
The way in which Chacha linked the mafia, crime, and Italian politics together in a series of best-selling books made him a high-profile and controversial character, perhaps partly because he felt no compulsion to offer happy endings or anything approaching justice at the end of his novels. A good example of this tendency in his work is his 1971 novel, Equal Danger, in which the detective is sent to Sicily to investigate a series of murders of judges. Shasha focuses on how and why the authorities are both unable and unwilling to conduct such investigations properly because of their own corruption. Not surprisingly, the detective fails to solve this case which illustrates the extent to which many of Chacha's novels can also be described as anti-detective novels. Chacha's persistent focus on the setting of Sicily indicates the extent to which, as critic G.J. Demko has pointed out, mass market mystery writers in Italy tend to have a very regional voice. Probably the best-known example of this fact in contemporary Italian mystery fiction is another Sicily-based writer by the name of Andrea Camilleri. Camilleri enjoyed a long career as a film and theater director before writing his first novel in his 50s. Even so, he didn't become a best-selling writer until he was nearly 70, when in 1994 he published The Shape of Water. The book was the first in what would become a long series of novels featuring Inspector Montalbano, a police detective in the police force of Vigata, an imaginary Sicilian town. One of the most notable features of Camilleri's Montalbano novels is the way in which they address persistently and aggressively a variety of social problems in contemporary Italy. Indeed, Camilleri has remarked that social commentary was always my aim. In many crime novels, the events seem completely detached from the economic, political, and social context in which they occur. In my books, I deliberately decided to smuggle into a detective novel a critical commentary on my times. This also allowed me to show the progression and evolution in the character of Montalbano. We can see this evolution in Montalbano in the form of frequent inner monologues in which he questions what it means to be a good detective in a society like Italy, where solving a case can actually put your life in danger. In this way, Camilleri reminds us that mystery and suspense fiction can not only reflect a society, but also hopefully contribute to changing that society. Montalbano also gives us a way of moving to the final stop of our European tour, because his name is an homage to the writer Manuel Vasquez Montalban, the Dean of Spanish Mystery Writers. Like the other countries we've looked at in this lecture, Spain has a long and fractious history when it comes to mystery and suspense fiction. A notable early example of the genre is the story El Clavo, written by Pedro Antonio de Alacón and published in 1853. In general, however, the genre had to wait until after the fall of the Franco regime in 1975 to truly come into its own. During this period, a number of authors came to the fore, including Eduardo Mendoza and Andreu Martín. But Montalban and his fictional private detective, Pepe Carvalho, are undoubtedly at the head of the pack. Carvalho is a rich and complex character that combines elements of the classical detective, like Rex Stout's Nero Wolf, he is a gastronome, and the hard-boiled detective, he's thoroughly at home on the mean streets of Barcelona. Beginning in 1972 with the publication of I Killed Kennedy, Montalban uses Cavallo to explore various aspects of Spanish society in the last half of the 20th century. In Murder in the Central Committee, for example, 
Montalban addresses the complexities of the transitional period in Spanish history between the death of General Franco and the restoration of a constitutional democracy. And in An Olympic Death, he examines a subject dear to his heart. Born in Barcelona and a passionate FC Barcelona supporter, in this novel, Montalban uses the conventions of mystery fiction to examine the largely negative changes that took place in his native city during the 1992 Olympic Games. A final significant detail about Pepe Carvalho is that he's a great traveler. Many of Montalban's novels featuring his private eye take place in other countries, including the Buenos Aires Quintet in Argentina, and the birds of Bangkok in Thailand. This is an appropriate detail with which to end this lecture because it reminds us of where we started. Our European tour has demonstrated that mystery and suspense fiction has an unparalleled ability to travel to a wide range of countries. It is able to both address specific issues in any one of those countries in an entertaining and thought-provoking manner while also remaining true to the genre's core elements that appeal to its legions of fans.